Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Interviewing Wednesdays, our special guest interview speaker series we have for the months of November and December. We are very glad you're with us today. It's December 8, 2021. Uh, if you have questions throughout the presentation, please just enter them into the chat window. If you'd like to network with each other, you're welcome to enter in your information so that people can see who you are and you all can connect with each other on LinkedIn after the presentation is over. For those people watching on Facebook, you're welcome to enter your question to the comment field. I'm monitoring that feed. We'll be sure to get those questions answered at the end of the presentation. Please note this event is being recorded. It's currently live on Facebook. The recording will be on the Career DFW Facebook page and the Career USA YouTube channel for others to view in the future. By participating in this event, you give consent for your name and picture to appear. Please note that any comments you put in the Zoom chat window will not appear in the recording. Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jeff Morris. Back in 2008, I started a website called careerdfw.org. In 2012, I started a second website, careerusa.org, to help those around the United States. I have written a book called What I've Learned About Your Job Search That You May Not Know. Since 2007, I've been facilitating and leading the North Dallas Plano Career Focus Group. Uh, we've got a very interesting presentation coming up this Friday, and I'll tell you about that at the end of the session. And since 2017, I've been a member of the practice interview team. Uh, you want to practice your interviewing skills. Very, very important. This is a totally free service. I will put some information in the Zoom chat window if you're interested in doing that. Well, for the months of November and December, we've given Mark and Walt the uh, weeks off. And uh, so we brought in special guest speakers to talk about different topics. Today, Tony Bashera, who is the leader of, uh, he runs Babgen Associates, one of the oldest recruiting firms in the Dallas Fort Worth area, will be talking about the 10 biggest mistakes that people make in interviewing. And uh, we will hear his presentation right after um, uh, Walt tells us a little bit about the interview success workshop. This is a recorded session. Uh, so any questions you have, I'll be glad to answer at the very end of the session. Good morning or good afternoon, everyone, and, and welcome, Tony. Uh, for the rest of you, Tony is a member of the I Want to Help Job Seekers Club uh, and also does it a free of charge. And you might want to pick up his book, Acing the Interview, which has a lot of aces of diamonds. Those diamonds are inside that book, a lot of things, a lot of questions, a lot of things to consider. Uh, you might want to pick that up. Anyway, what do I do? I like to help people with interviewing skills as well, but I do it a little differently. I do the fundamentals. <clears throat> it's like in basketball, if you can't dribble and you can't shoot, why play the game? So we need to learn how to dribble and shoot. Uh, in golf, you gotta learn how to hit the ball. If you can't hit the ball, how are you gonna do anything? Uh, you, you gotta know how to uh, do the fundamentals of just about anything that you're involved in. And so you do the same thing in interviewing. So I like to try to teach the differentiation, how we can do that, how we can differentiate ourselves positively from those other candidates and how can we sell ourselves? So everybody pretty much understands that interview is a sales situation and that we're selling ourselves. And when I ask people, what does that really mean? Uh, I get these long pauses. And so I suggest that we are selling who we are, what we do and how we can help. Many interviews are on the I do side and a little bit maybe on the uh, characteristics and soft skills guys, but I really don't see a whole lot of selling the value that we bring to the job. So that's the I help side. So I like to help with the fundamentals of doing that. I like to ask you questions out of the 11 basic categories of questions so that you can practice those. How do you handle types of questions? What kind of strategies, option, approaches, structures that you might be able to use in responding to that type of question? And responding always depends on three things. What's the question? Who's asking it? and where are you in the process? So that's what the workshop does. It's free. A lot of details are on my LinkedIn page. Uh, you can register by sending me an email at my Yahoo email address and ask for some availability dates. It's a very informal process. It's a learning interview more than a mock interview where you're gonna be graded, whatever. We're just trying to improve our skills and be different from those other candidates in a very positive and memorable way. So send me an email. I'll be, I would love to put you on the 
registration and get your schedules so we can have a little bit of fun. And I call it learning without squirming. Uh, today, Tony Bashir is with us. Tony uh, owns and runs Babbage and Associates, uh, an outstanding recruiting firm here in the Dallas School Worth area. Um, I got my last job I had, I got through Babbage and Associates. Uh, I, I really, you know, when you hear about certain uh, firms, it's like there's the good ones and there's ones you're not really sure of. If you can deal, if, if you can find something at, at uh, Babbage and Associates, it's definitely worthwhile. So Tony's going to talk about the 10 biggest mistakes that uh, people make in interviewing. Tony, thank you for being with us. It's always a pleasure, Jeff. It, you're kind to do it, and, and we really appreciate what you're doing for the community. Thank you very much. All right. Um, we're going to briefly discuss the top 10 mistakes that people make in an initial interview, and then we'll take any questions that you might have. Um, I've prepared this for a number of different venues, so we'll go through some of these really quickly. Um, there we go. I've been doing this since 1973. I've personally placed more than 11,000 candidates on a one-on-one -on -one basis. I've probably gotten more than 100,000 people interviews in that period of time. Uh, I've written four best-selling books on how to find a job. We have a 60-hour online program that we recently rewrote called thejobsearchsolution.com. I am the president of Babbage and Associates. We are the oldest placement and recruitment firm in the state of Texas, probably in the Southwest. Um, we do everything that you can imagine except healthcare. We don't do any healthcare. We do banking, finance, accounting, sales, you name it, we do it. 99% of what we do is in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, some Austin, some Houston. So the mistakes that people make in the interviewing process, these are simple mistakes and they're simple to deal with. The first biggest mistake is that they think that they, they forget that an initial interview, especially all interviews, but especially the initial one is a selling situation. So many candidates come to me with the idea of, they think it's a consumer product. They are looking to, well, what, what do they want and how do they want it and who do they want it with instead of recognizing that what they need to do is be selling themselves. And I tell people all the time, you sell yourself until you get to the altar. Until then, nothing matters. And until you get a job offer, nothing matters. So the idea that I'm buying and I have to be concerned about what, what they're look what I'm gonna get out of the deal doesn't mean a darn thing until you sell yourself. If you give them enough good reasons of why they ought to hire you, they're gonna give you plenty of good reasons of why you ought to go to work there. And if you have it in your head that you're selling, selling, selling all of the time, you won't have a problem. Uh, the second one is people have a tendency to think that this is a two-way street. I heard it this morning from a candidate. Well, you know, it's a two-way street. It's not a two-way street. There's one of, there's the hiring authority. And in this market, there's an average of 14 candidates that are all trying to get the same job you are. It is not a two-way street. It's a 14-way street. Until you get to the altar, it's not a two-way uh, two street. Now, once you get to the altar and you want to try to exchange nuptials and try to get together, then it becomes, what can you do for me in the process. But until then, it's not a two-way street. If you give enough good reasons of why they ought to hire you, they're going to give you plenty of good reasons of why you go to, ought to go to work there, and you can worry about that later. I had a candidate the other day, even after my coaching and my teaching, sometimes I wonder, what the heck? But he goes to an interview, and he's halfway through the interview, and he says, by the way, what does it pay? Yeah. He already knew what it paid because I told him, but he wanted to hear it. He said, well, I just wanted to hear it from the, no, no, no. What, what they can do for you questions, forget them. They're going to answer all of those once they, once they have an idea that they want to hire you. Oops, I'll get this right in a minute. Okay, people have a tendency to focus on what they want in a job. Don't worry about what you want in a job you got to focus on what the employer wants in the job. 
if you give an employer what he wants or she wants, then they're going to tell you what they can do for you. If you don't like what they can do for you, you don't have to take the job. We say it here all the time. You can't turn down an offer you don't have. Quit focusing on what you want. I get candidates all of the time and I ask them, what are you looking for in an opportunity? And my goodness, they'll have a litany of, of things that they want. But then when I ask them, well, what are you going to do for a, a prospective employer? Well, you know, I'm a good employee and well, well, and they hadn't thought of that. And that's the most important thing they ought to be thinking about, not what they want in a job, but what does the employer want in the job? And then the fourth mistake is they don't know what they're really selling. I can't tell you the number of candidates I've interviewed over the years where I say, okay, now, what are you selling to a prospective employer? Well, I'm a good employee. I'm just a good employee. Well, how do you know you're a good employee? Well, everybody I've ever worked for said they really like me. Well, yeah, but what specifically are you going to be able to do for them that the other people they're going to interview can't? Well, I have to think about that. Yeah, you really do have to think about that. And you've got to come down to absolute specifics. And I tell people you've got, in fact, I told this to an employer yesterday, the hiring authority is so wrapped up in his process of interviewing, they're going through five different kinds of interviews, that the hiring authority is forgetting to look at the candidate's track record. And what the candidate has got to sell is, I have been successful in my past. Here is where I have been successful. And therefore, I'm going to be successful for you. And the more specific that a candidate is about where his successes have been. In fact, I recommend the more numbers that you can associate with your success. I increased sales. I collected debt. I somehow come up with as, as much as many statistical uh, um, issues as to why and how you've been successful, something that's measurable, something that I'm just a good employee, that doesn't tell people anything. If you say, I haven't missed a day of work in 14 years, and I've gone the extra mile because I, I, um, uh, I volunteered for this committee, and we got this done, the more you quantify things, the better off you're going to be. So you got to know what you're selling. And uh, Jeff brought up something earlier that is really important that you've got to practice this stuff. It does not come naturally. And I teach it in our job search solution program. And I know Jeff does too, and your all's program does, but you've got to have a lip load of presentations of every job you've had, what you've done, how successful you were, and then communicate the idea that it's going to also be successful for them because you've been successful in the past. The fifth mistake is they can't bridge or articulate for the employer their specific abilities. Rarely are you ever going to run into a job that's exactly like the job you had. So you have to bridge for the hiring authority. I, I claim that it you've got to make the, uh, make the bridge for them, but you've got to do their thinking for them. You've got to be able to say, now, look, I was successful in this job. Here's what made me successful in that job. And from what I understand, what you are looking for or you need in the job you're interviewing for are the kind of skills that I have. Here is where I've done it before. And you've got to make that bridge for them. You've got to articulate not just what you've done, but how it applies to what they want done and literally do their thinking for them. The sixth mistake, poor communication skills. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I'll know. Uh, poor um, body language, uh, not leaning forward in your, uh, in your chair, not animating enough in the right way. We have a whole course on this in our job search solution. I can't tell you the number of candidates I've seen lose out in deals 
because of their very poor body language. And it's not because they're sloppy, it's because they're scared. Look, next to death of a spouse, death of a parent, death of a child coupled with divorce, the fourth most emotional thing we do is look for a job. And it often shows up in the interviewing process. They slouch, they don't speak clearly, they mumble, they don't look people in the eye. And I realize in many professions, it's not common to, I mean, you can get away without looking people in the eye. But in the interviewing process, you can't do that. And as we mentioned earlier, you got to practice this stuff. It does not come naturally. But those communication skills have to be strong. They don't, they don't necessarily have to be animated, and they don't necessarily have to be forceful. It's nice if they are, but just as long as you communicate and you make sure that you're communicating the right kind of thing, answers to questions can be short and answers to questions could be right to the point, but they have to be the right answers. And it has to come across as um, interested and professional. Um, it, and over the past few years, um, lots of dressing and dressing differently. It, when I got in this business, everything was coat and tie. It is in our organization too, every day, coat and tie. Uh, but it, it, uh, it, things have changed a little bit, but still slouching and not speaking clearly and mumbling and that kind of thing, people will get lost in the manner in which you speak more than the matter of what you do. Seventh mistake is improper dress and poor body language. I mentioned this a little bit ago. Um, don't assume everybody's casual. Don't assume that just because I had a candidate show up in a coat and tie, a dress a suit, and, and I'll be darned if the guy that was interviewing him wasn't wearing flip-flops and, and, um, and cutoffs. That doesn't matter. You go dress like you're looking to borrow a million dollars. Is somebody going to lend you a million dollars? Even if you overdress, it's better to overdress than it is to underdress. And I've, even to this day, I've had candidates go in with um, a, a golf shirt that this happened the other day. Guy goes in with a golf shirt that was checkered or something. I don't know. The employer said, and then he had a sport coat over it and it just looked terrible. It looked like the guy just had the had the um, the sport coat hung up in his car and didn't matter what he was wearing. He just put the sport coat on. The hiring authority was so distracted by that, he claimed that the candidate was disrespectful because he didn't dress the right way. And uh, it just, and it, uh, it got in the way of the quality of the candidate because he was actually a pretty good candidate. And he said, well, his, his excuse was, well, I, you know, when I, I even go into the office now, even though we used to not work from, we used to work from home. And if I go in dressed like I'm looking for an interview, like I'm looking for a job, they'll know. So I put, but well, okay, fine. But if you're going to do that, explain to a hiring authority, look, I came from work. We dress casually there. You can dress casually in a nicer way where it doesn't look so weird as it looked in this particular case. And the hiring authority was so distracted by the whole thing, he never heard what the candidate had to say. And this was a 15 year experienced guy. So it wasn't some kid right out of school. Huh. The eighth mistake is not researching the company or the position that a person's interviewing for. You would think, you would think with all of the information that we have available to us, LinkedIn, the internet, I mean, my goodness, there's more information out there than you can possibly imagine. I am shocked that even after I teach candidates or sell the idea of do your research on the company and the person you're interviewing and all of that, it's just amazing that people just show up and say, well, I just really haven't had time to go and look the research up, but tell me, what do you do here? And, and, and I'm talking professional people that have been around for a while. Look, 
if you don't show enough interest in the opportunity to do the research on the job and the person that's in it, um, I've had candidates that have called people in the company to find out about the job, connected with other people that have worked there before. I had a candidate not too long ago, he had read some white papers uh, that the company published. He knew more about the white papers of what the pump the company had published than the guy that was doing the interviewing. And the guy that was doing the interviewing was pretty impressed by that. He said, I learned a lot about my company from your candidate. The guy did the research. It's not that hard to do. It doesn't take all that long, but you just don't look very interested in what you're applying for if you don't do that kind of thing. The ninth mistake is the inability to articulate what you'd like to see in a new job. Now, I'm not talking about money and benefits and parking and PTO and all of that. No, no, no. I'm talking about when somebody asks you, what are you looking for in a job? It's very important for a candidate to come up with intrinsic growth. I'm looking to grow intellectually, spiritually, intrinsically in an opportunity. I'd like to learn more. I'd like to be pressed a little bit. I find in some of the jobs that I've had before, I learned them and I didn't grow personally. You need to be able to communicate where you want to grow personally in a job. Because the truth is, if you're not growing on the inside, intellectually, from your heart, uh, spiritually, in a situation, you'll, after a while, not be not very interested in the opportunity and you won't work very hard. The kind of people that are most successful are the kind of people that figure out how to grow mentally and spiritually in their job. And so you need a couple of answers to that. What I'm looking for in the job is an opportunity to grow spiritually and mentally, and I want to be challenged. And from what I understand from talking around and doing my research, people can do that here in this kind of organization. That's why I want to be a part of it. And then the 10th mistake, ugh, they badmouth their present employer or their past employer. And a common sense would tell you that you don't do that, okay? But I guess common sense, even after 47 years of doing this, common sense isn't very common. Um, I, I just can't, and I warn candidates, because when I interview them, they'll say, my company is this and my boss is that. And I realize there are a lot of screwball companies out there. There are a lot of screwball people out there. But you don't go in and talk about your past employer in any other way other than I really respect the people that I work for. I've enjoyed the opportunity. I've certainly learned a lot. Here are the reasons that I'm looking to leave. And they better be good business reasons. But bad-mouthing your employer, saying negative things about them, a hiring authority is going to think and, and assume that whatever you say about the people you've worked for before, you're going to eventually say about them. So no matter how horrific your situation might be, unless they've stolen money from you, and even then, I'd be careful about that, always have something positive to say. One of my associates here calls it a um, compliment sandwich. You say something positive about them, and then you give them a reason that is reasonable that you might be leaving for, and then another positive statement so that you couch whatever your reasons you are looking to leave in a positive way rather than a bad mouth way. And then there are also some things that you got to, these are kind of minor, discussing personal problems in an interview. Well, I'm looking to leave because I'm going through a terrible divorce or uh, I'm suing my last employer. I had a candidate just two weeks, last week. He was, the interview was going so well. And he said to the hiring authority, well, I had to sue my last employer for the money that they owed me. Ah, end of interview. What do you think an employer is going to think about that? And this guy, he, 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 what's so funny about it is he threatened to sue him. He never really did sue him. He's still at the same place that he was. 
this was, he threatened them a, a year earlier. But do you think an employer wants to hear something like that? They don't. Being late for an interview, if you're in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, you got to know that wherever you're going to drive to, you got to get there a half hour earlier because we don't build up, we build out. And this is flat. And LBJ is crazy. The toll road is crazy. Every place you drive to is crazy. You got to be there early. And, and I even have candidates that drive to the place the night before just to be sure that they can get there. And don't necessarily rely on Google Maps. It can take you the wrong place and then you're late. And then of course, once you're late, not apologizing for being late. I, I bet this happens even with my candidates and I deal with professional salespeople, semi-professional salespeople and that, that will, will they'll show up late and they won't apologize. I mean, you wouldn't do that anywhere. And now don't go overboard. If you go in and go, oh my God, I'm late. I'm so sorry, I'm late. And all you do is talk about being late. You'll go overboard with it, but apologize for being late. Um, not closing the interview properly. We've talked about this on this program before, but there are four basic questions you have to ask in every interview. They are, first of all, have I made it very clear what my experience and my background is? Does anybody have any questions about what I've done and where I've done it? That lots of people will act like they know what you're talking about in an interviewing situation, but they don't understand. They don't want to appear ignorant, so they'll act like they understand. You'll walk out of the door, and then they'll go, you know, I didn't really understand what the guy was talking about. So you ask, are there any clarifications I need to make about my experience or my background? Secondly, how does my experience and background stack up with what you're looking for? If I'm in your shoes, do I what strengths and what weaknesses might I have? Do you have any concerns about my ability to do the job? And then number four, how do I stack up with the other candidates that you've interviewed? and get a really good idea uh, and, and stop. And then the fourth one and most important one, what do I need to do to get the job? Now I get candidates all the time that say, well, what if I don't want the job? You don't know whether you want the job or not until you get an offer. We had a candidate not too long ago that went into an interview for a controller's position. The con job paid 175,000 he sold himself so well, they offered him 275000 So you, you got to do it right and sell it right. Those four basic questions, they're killer questions. Um, they are ones that you absolutely have to ask in order to get the job. And if you do a good job of that, if nothing else, you know exactly how you stand. So those are the 10 biggest mistakes that people make. There's a much broader uh, uh, presentation about this in the jobsearchsolution.com. So, any questions? Yes, uh, Daniel, why don't you unmute your mic and I'll let you ask your question. Yeah, sure. So, when I do company research, I can find a lot of general information about the company, but sometimes I want to ask specifically like, so what does your team do? What's kind of the specific focus you're doing beyond the job description? Is that going to make me look like I haven't prepared well, or is there a good way to ask that? No, that's not a bad way to ask it. it you got to put it in context. Mm -hmm. It depends on how many other questions you might have, the rapport that you might be having with the, the interviewing authority or that kind of thing? That's a fair question because no matter what anybody publishes on their website or no matter what anybody tells you, even in the lobby, there's always going to be a hidden lots going on in the company that you may not know about. That's a reasonable question. That's a reasonable question. All right. Thank you. Uh, John's asking, can you please restate the four questions at the end of the interview that you want to ask again? Sure. And the job search solution goes into these things in real detail. But the first one is, have I made it clear about what my experience is? 
And do you have any questions about my experience or background that I didn't make clear? Interestingly enough, although the other three are more pointed, that is probably one of the best questions you can ask. Because I'll tell you, when people are asking you questions, they spend, I don't know, but it'll probably 50% of their time thinking about the next question rather than what your answer is. I know employers that I work with that don't even take notes on the candidates they interview. I mean, that's crazy. You interview a candidate two weeks ago, unless you take copious notes, you don't remember who you talked to. You, you just don't. So lots of times you'll explain what you do and you think you've communicated, well, they know what I've done, but they don't. And you gotta ask them, have I made it clear? So are there any questions about my experience and my background that I need to elaborate on? And I guarantee you, there's gonna be one of those people in that group or one person that's gonna say, yeah, you know, this job you had two, two jobs ago, I don't really understand what you did there. Can you explain it to me? So that's really an important question. Then the second question is, uh, do you have any concerns about my ability to do the job? Now, what you're gonna find out there is, how are you stacking up? Uh, are you long in some areas and short in other areas? Do you have, um, do they have any concerns? I had a candidate this morning. The, um, uh, she asked that question and it was a, a Zoom interview and the group that she asked with, one of them said, well, it doesn't appear in your background. I place primarily IT salespeople. It doesn't appear anywhere in your background where you've done uh, financial application demos. And she said, oh, yes, I have. Well, part of their job is as a salesperson in this company is be able is to be able to do uh, WebEx um, uh, demos. And this guy didn't get the idea that she had done that before. I guarantee you the other three people in that interview didn't get that idea either. If he didn't get it, they didn't get it. And so she was able to say, yes, in this, this job I had, and she pointed out the job she had, she said, I didn't even understand the software and I learned it within a couple of three weeks of how to demo it. So asking that question about where am I strong and where am I weak is basically what you're doing. And then how do I stack up with the other candidates that you've interviewed? Most employers don't know how to answer that question because they never get asked it. You would be surprised. You would be really surprised. I had a candidate ask that the other day and they said, I don't know, you're the first one we've talked to. Okay, that's fair enough. But at least they'll give you an idea of how you stack up and you know uh, about the other people that were talked. I had a candidate a couple of weeks ago ask that and they said, they said to the candidate, well, you know, your skills are really good. We do have an internal candidate that we really like. Well, now what that tells the candidate is that an internal candidate most of the time always has an advantage because they know the person. They probably aren't as good as the candidates that frankly, this sounds self-serving, that I can come up with. I can probably come up with better candidates than what they have internally, but they know the person. So my candidate knew then that he was up against an internal candidate that was he was going to have a hard time fighting that battle. And then the last one, and just real blunt, what do I need to do to get the job? And you'll be shocked at the number of people that you ask that of, that they just start laughing and they go, man, that's a good question. Nobody seems to ask that question. Now, the irony to all of this is I give people my job search solution and out of four, on average, out of four candidates, even though I teach it, only one of them asks all of those four questions. I don't get it. I just don't understand. You need a job. I'm telling you some of the things you need to do to get it. 
and only one out of four asks it. And when I ask them, when I ask the other three, why didn't you ask? Well, it just didn't seem appropriate. Well, I wasn't quite sure. Well, we ran out of time. Blah, 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 blah. What it means is you just didn't have the courage to find out where do you stand. Look, when you're looking for a job, no is the second best answer you can get. If you're not going to hire my candidate, let me know now. The sooner you let me know, I may not agree with it. I may not like it. But at least I know. No is no. That means we move on to the next one. Yes, no, those are great. It's that maybe that kills you. And that's where people spend most of, even I, even I do, after all these years, spend the emotional time and effort in that maybe. So, you know, it, and if you're, not a, if you're not a candidate, that's fine. Find out quickly. Um, you know, it's that age old question of they want you to talk about salary before they tell you what the range is. So how do you eloquently skirt around that? Great question. Get asked that all the time. Here's what I would say as a candidate. In the past, in my last job or my present job, I'm presently making or I've made X amount of dollars. I'm not as concerned about the amount of money as I'm concerned about the opportunity, the growth, and the people. So tell them what you've been earning, but don't say, this is what I'm looking for, or this is what I need. Now, there are some, this is a paradox, and this is screwball, but in the state of California, and I'm not sure if it's true in New York, but I know in the state of California, you can't ask people what they've been making when they're in the interview. Now, after you go to hire them, you can find out what they've been making. Now, that's stupid because if they've been making more than totally a lot more than what you're going to pay, then they're not going to get hired anyhow. So, you know, I, I've had candidates. I say, what have you been making? And they say, I don't want to tell you. End of interview, as far as I'm concerned, that's not going to fly. They may have reasons for doing it. They may not want me to know. They Usually it's because they feel like they've been grossly underpaid. That has nothing to do with it. It has to do with, if I ask that question, I'm in my opinion, in my business, I'm going to have to tell my client because they're going to ask me. And the candidates in the same thing. So don't tell them necessarily what you're looking for. Just say, this is what I've made in the past, but I'm flexible. If I've been out of work six months, I'm real flexible. <laughs> if I've been out of work a year, I'm really, really, really flexible. If I'm on my present job and I'm leaving for maybe different reasons, I may not be as flexible, but they don't need to know that. This is what I've earned in the past. I'm open to the future. Whatever you do, and some guru on the, I listen to stuff all the time on the internet about getting a job and some yay who was on there was saying that when you get asked that question, don't answer it, just ask the question, well, what does a job pay? Ugh. Any question that has to do with what are you going to do for me is a stupid question. Please don't do it. So I've got a question for you. So of all the, uh, the placements that you all make that Babbage makes, what percentage of jobs do you already know what the salary is so you can prep the candidate when you're sending them in? 99% uh, of them we know, and we're able to give them an idea of what the range is. <laughs> sometimes people listen, sometimes they don't. Um, and uh, we, we, try to, we try to make it reasonable for the candidate. And, and the employer knows that we're going to do that. Sometimes employers tell us wrong, you know, uh, people, I read it in a book not too long ago, because I'm reading this kind of stuff all the time, that companies are going to publish the mid-range of the salary. That's not necessarily true. I mean, they're going to publish whatever they publish. Just handle it by being just careful. You're going to have, most of the time, somewhat of an idea before you go in. What you don't want to do is price yourself out of the opportunity because there might be some really growth there. 
if money was the most important thing that people worked for, we'd all sell cocaine. You know, I mean, it's ridiculous. So you 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 answer the question by this is what I've made in the past, but I'm interested in growth. And then stop. Okay, uh, Leslie, do you want to ask ask your question? Okay, uh, so I had a I wanted to know what kind of an answer could I expect from uh, asking what do I need to do to get the job. I had no idea uh, what are they going to say? Are they going to say you need to do this, this, and this, and 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 and, and do three leapfrogs? I had no idea. Yeah, uh, pat your head, rub your belly, and sing the national anthem. Now, it, the issue, don't worry about the answer. The answer isn't anywhere near as important as the fact that you asked the question. They may not even have an answer. It's going to be an answer of some like, well, we've got 22 other candidates. I'm being facetious. We've got a few other candidates that we're going to talk to. We feel like that you have uh, provided us all the information that we, that we need, but we appreciate your asking. And then you can even come back. Is there anything else I can do to enhance my position? The fact that you had the guts to ask it and that you're willing to say, you're going to hire me or not, puts you in a light that is more courageous than most candidates. Most people are afraid somebody's going to say, nah, you're not going to get hired here anyhow. Well, okay, fine. You know, I mean, you're going to get 14 to 15 no's before you get a yes anyhow. Just a, a, another little story. In the uh, pit crew, we had a candidate once who during, and he came back and told us that after the interview or during the interview at the very end, he said, you know, I saw that empty desk out there. Would that, would that be my desk? And the guy sort of like chuckled from it and actually, he did get the job because he took it to the next step. I had a candidate one time that interviewed with the CEO. It's now a billion dollar company. And the CEO said it was not that big at the time. We'll let you know. And he, he, one Monday morning, he showed up, went to one of the empty desks, um, opened up his briefcase set his whole desk up. The CEO walks in and says, who's that guy? And the admin told him, he said, she said, he's your new hire. He said, oh, okay, I guess so. Guy was there 15 years. <laughs> he never really got offered the job. He took the job. Now, that's pretty gutsy, but you know, he made their decision for him. He wound up being a really good, good guy for the company. It takes guts. I don't know that I'd recommend that, but I mean, what's the worst? They throw you out? I mean, you know, so what? <laughs> right. Uh, I had a question about next steps, uh, interview closing questions. Do you have any recommendation about how to ask those? Sure. If depending on the answer you get from what do I need to do to get the job, I have some candidates that soften that by say, what's the next step? I don't like that. Because what they say is, well, the next step is we're going to have people back and uh, we're going to do this and that and the other thing. Well, okay, then, then you might ask, how do I be certain that I'm going to be one of those? Okay. <laughs> and, and look, you might as well be aggressive. Most candidates aren't. And they, and they call me back and they say, well, they told me that the next steps are they're having people back next Tuesday. Well, are you going to be one of them? Well, I don't know. Well, you know, know where you stand. And, you know, what do I need to do to get the job? What are the other steps in the process? And, I'm, and am I going to be in, and you can say it nicely with a smile on your face, am I going to be in that group that comes back to speak with you all? Uh, that is Tony's presentation. I know we've got some questions here. Let me go through and answer some of the questions that popped up here. Let's see here. First question or first comment Riley made was, 
do this over here. First comment was, I've watched people getting passed up for role when they were totally qualified because they had no personality. You know, uh, if there are many people who can fulfill the requirement of the role, personality becomes a big factor. And that's always a that's always the case. I mean, why do they? Why do you think that you have to meet the boss's boss? And that's usually because they just want to see can you walk and talk and you know do I like you? I mean, one of the questions I always ask salespeople when I do when I interview people is, okay, we're in Denver at the Air, Denver airport. It's snowing out. We're stuck here at the airport for seven hours before our flight because of snow. What are you going to be talking about with me? Because I want to know what you know what you're going to do. What, what you know? How awkward is this going to be for the next seven hours? Do I like you? You know, we can talk about sports. What are we going? You know, what is it? So, uh, you know, personality is a huge part of of uh, getting hired in a job. Uh, let's see here. Another question. Uh, the interviewer, uh, let's see here, Laura, now Laura asked, I asked, had an interview yesterday with a major bank. The interviewer said the next step, she wants to talk to me. She wants me to talk to her line manager and promises to email me her contact details. She hasn't emailed her yet. Uh, do you have, if you have her comment, if you have her information, reach out, be proactive. I mean, that's one of the things I always tell people. Don't let somebody else run your job search for you. You've got to go. You've got to make those decisions. You've got to make the phone calls. You've got to send the emails. And, you know, at some point, if it's too much, they'll get a restraining order against you to tell you to stop contacting them. But until that time, you've got to be proactive. You've got to take the bull by the horns and go, okay, uh, how can I reach out to this person? I mean, call the front desk. I just had a conversation with the person yesterday. Can I get to their voicemail? Can I get their email address? Look them up on LinkedIn, whatever it's going to take. Uh, you know, don't you run your job search. Nobody else runs it for you. Uh, let's see here. Another question. Another job coach said uh, not to ask questions in a negative manner at the end of the interview. So, OK, so I know it's sort of what he said at the very end. How do I, you know, is there anything that I haven't answered about my jobs, what I've done that could be of concern? The way I like to ask the question is, how do I compare to the ideal candidate? I don't want, I don't care about the other candidates. I want to know how do I compare to the ideal candidate? You know, what is it you're looking for? What is it, you know, you we've talked for a half hour, we've talked for an hour, you know, you've got to know me. Is there anything that I don't, you know, I'm not your ideal candidate? I, I think that's always a really good question to ask. Uh, let's see here. Um, you asked what was the fourth question, and Riley answered that. I've made it clear that what I've done and where I've done it at. So just making it up to everybody. Uh, how do you like? Uh, how do you handle niche jobs? So if you want to unmute your mic and tell me what niche jobs are, tell me what you're what you're talking about. You see, I'm in the scientific field, pharmaceutical and dietary supplements. Okay. So some of the points the career coach gave, like be aggressive and and the salary requirements be upfront. It can both go both ways when you're looking for a job. So all right. So yeah, all right. So I have a better understanding now. So you have to remember that. Uh, Tony talks from the point of being a salesperson. That's what he is. You know, he's placing uh, technical salespeople, business salespeople. That that's his primary role. So in sales, you have to be very proactive and not afraid to really say anything and go after stuff. I understand in a uh, research in a university kind of situation, you're uh -huh. really restricted to. You got to play by their rules because. You know, that's what they want. They they don't want to see your two-page resume. They want to see your 10-page resume. They want to know everything you've ever done. So, you know, you just adapt by these things. But I don't think it's wrong to, you know, some of his closing questions about, you know, how do I compare to the ideal candidate? You know, is there anything that I haven't that we've that we haven't talked about that, you know, you've got a concern that's in my resume? I mean, it's nice to get those things out of the way. Uh 
I think people will appreciate it being up front. And I think it's okay to be a little proactive. You know, what do I need you to do to get the job? If that's what you really want, if you really want the job, I think you need to ask for it. So, you know, in what you've been doing, I understand you may not want to be quite as uh, outgoing, but it mm -hmm. will set you apart if you're a little bit more outgoing than other people. I mean, you know, I, I go back to how can you, uh, how, here's a joke, how can you tell an outgoing engineer? Well, an outgoing engineer will look at your shoes instead of their shoes. You know, so they're looking up, you know, so make sure you look at somebody. You've got to build that rapport. Um, let's see here. Da, 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 da. Have I answered everybody? Oh, you don't have their information only on LinkedIn. Yeah, reach out to them on LinkedIn. Call up the front off, call up the front. You know, you know the name of the bank, call them, say, I had a conversation with this person yesterday. Can I get to their voicemail and leave the person a voicemail? You know, it's not a nothing wrong with doing that. Any other questions we can ask uh, answer for anybody? You know, Tony. Tony tells it the way it is. He's been doing this for what do you say, thirty seven years, forty seven years, and you know, he has seen hundreds and hundreds of people talk about, you know, and, and get people hired. You know, like I said, I got my last job through there. The reason I got my job through them is because. I had built a rapport with the recruiter and he knew that I was a good interviewer and that he could send me out and I would do well during an interview. Some of the jobs I wasn't interested in, but he sent me anyway because he says, you're gonna make my other candidates look good. And I was okay doing that. And, you know, but then the job came up that I was the ideal candidate for and, you know, boom, boom, it was done within a week. I was working the following Monday, so. Uh, I don't know, Babbage and Associates, great organization. So uh, that's everybody's questions. I really appreciate it, everybody being here. Uh, let me share a couple closing slides and uh, we will finish up today. Uh, Career to FW and Career USA, we're putting on training four days a week. Hopefully you will join us again. Uh, to, whoops, let's see here. Tomorrow, uh, we have a great presentation. Mike Perry, uh, I saw his presentation several months ago. He's from the Ohio. It, Northern Ohio area around Cleveland. Uh, he talks to a lot of job clubs up there. And his presentation is how to make a networking strategy that works. It's a very good presentation. Uh, you really, you will get some real good basics out of it. So please join us tomorrow at one o'clock. It's the second, we do networking on the second and fourth Thursdays. This Friday at the North Dallas Plano Career Focus Group, Mike Chapman will be with us. Mike is a uh, insurance consultant. I mean, he has been helping the unemployed for 10 or 15 years now dealing with insurance. COBRA is not necessarily the best way to deal with it, uh, but he can talk about other Medicare, other medical insurance options and updates and common pitfalls to avoid. So it'll be a very interesting presentation. Please join us this Friday morning at 930. Next uh, Wednesday, our speaker, our final speaker for the year will be Jack Bick. He'll be talking about clarity when you need it most about interviewing. Uh, so that will round out our speaker series for the, uh, for the two months. And then I'm hoping in January, our plan, very interesting idea here. Our plan in January is to actually show real interviews. So if you'd like to practice your interviewing skills, we're actually gonna do it live at one o'clock uh, or we'll hopefully play back some people's recordings who's a, who've allowed us to play the recording back. But uh, you'll actually get to see a real interview being performed through the practice interview team. Um, so, you know, if you'd like to participate, if you'd like to be interviewed, uh, we'd love to be able to have you do it starting in January. Uh, we'll sort of see how this goes. So uh, it's, it's a really interesting process. Uh, they've been doing it, like I said, for the last year and a half closed and only the three interviewers and the uh, interviewee have been together. So we, you know, I'm really encouraged about opening this up and we're going to need volunteers. We're going to need you to volunteer to want to do it. So if you're interested, you need a job description, an email, uh, your resume, and then let us know that you're willing to do it Wednesday at one o'clock and just send that email to dallaspickcrew at gmail.com. Remember, when we were meeting in person, 
you didn't have a choice. You had spectators who were watching you being interviewed back when we were meeting in person. So this is sort of the same thing. You're not going to see them on the screen. You're only going to see the four people who are participating in the interview. Everybody else will have their cameras and mics turned off. So it'll be a hopefully a very interesting process, but we need people to volunteer to want to do it. Uh, this session has been recorded. It will be on the Career DFW Facebook page and the Career USA YouTube channel. Uh, on, the, oh, uh, on the Career USA YouTube channel, if you'd like to see any of the 13 sessions that Mark and Walt put together about interviewing, this is about 20 hours of material. If you're able to go through and make it all, the first five sessions here are all about preparing for an interview. The second five sessions are all about what to do during the interview. And then the last three are some advanced topics. So if you're interested, all of these sessions are on the Career USA YouTube channel. It looks like this. Click on playlist where the green arrow is, and then down below, select the interviewing tab. And where you see the red arrow, click view full playlist. And then up will come a list of all the different titles and topics in chronological order. And you can go back and find whichever one you'd like to go and uh, get more details on. Or you can start at the beginning of lesson one and work your way through. If you're not receiving the emails about our workshops and you'd like to join the Career USA mailing list, please do so. Send an email to Career USA, the plus sign subscribe at groups.io. Uh, you will never be spammed, but what you will get is the topic of the day, the title of the day, and most importantly, the Zoom link of the day. That way you can just open the email up and you'll be able to uh, find the email and you'll be able to find the Zoom link so you can just join us when we get started. So please remember, Career DFW, we're a 501c3 nonprofit organization. All of our speakers, I'm a volunteer. All of our speakers are volunteers. I haven't been paid to do any of this over the last 13 years. This is what I do to give back to the community and help you in your job search. So please, please uh, can consider making a donation when you land your next opportunity. So thank you very much for joining us today. Hopefully we'll see you later in the week. Uh, everybody have a great uh, Wednesday afternoon. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you.